thank you, Richard, uh, for the invitation, and uh, also thanks uh, for the organizers uh, for your kind invitation. I hope uh, I will not uh, fail you in uh, all the expectations you have, because you know the task I have is not easy to pull down all the genetic discoveries <clears throat> that have been done since uh, maybe the, the mid '90s. Uh, to give it in a user-friendly manner, I, I try my best. So, before we, we go, the, my, my training is cancer genetics, so you will, you know, uh, uh, see that uh, uh, I have to take you through the very basic principles of, of how cancer initiates. And this is a, <clears throat> a sketch where I uh, make a parallel with the solid tumors, where uh, a single cell in a tissue acquires genetic changes, and that leads to some sort of overgrowth uh, in a stage where it's still benign, still not threatening uh, the organism. And at some point, uh, this benign tumor, you know, starts to metastasize and, and, you know, essentially completes its evolution to a stage where it can be no, no longer restricted on one place in the tissue, but can migrate. So these metastatic cells then can then populate the rest of the body. So this is a considered the ultimate evolutionary stage of the solid tumor. So if you would like to make a parallel with, with blood malignancy, it is, it's, it's quite a different situation because we are facing a liquid tumor. So this, uh, you know, blood malignancies by their nature, they basically travel from the bone marrow and they are basically uh, right there everywhere uh, in, in the body. So uh, it is quite a challenge to, to stage and, and, and genetically characterize the so-called liquid tumor because in here you could just biopsy individual stages of a solid tumor, you could sort of associate where the mutation emerged first time and where it emerged you know, in, a, in a chronic phase. So in the hematology field, this has been done by a number of tricks that the hematologists uh, apply. They're, they're looking at the mature, maturation status of these cells, and this is how um, the hematologists stage and somehow classify the so-called uh, uh, liquid tumor. So. Um, what I will do today is try to explain you all the genetic changes that, that eventually uh, lead to uh, acute leukemic uh, transformation. And in MPN, this relates uh, somewhere uh, in here. So most of the chronic phase MPN patients are, you know, are very uh, uh, valid, uh, parallel, some are, uh, you know, equivalent to a, to a benign tumor. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the MPN equivalent of, of this later stage would be the leukemic transformation of the chronic phase MPN. So this is the parallel that we are trying to make. And this sort of breakdown of the chronic phase and the advanced MPN phase I will use throughout the talk. So in order to understand the genetics of MPN, you have to understand a little bit of how blood cells are made. And this is happening in the bone marrow, and the cells responsible for the production of this wild variety of blood elements that you can see in the blood here are the called hematopoietic stem cells. And they have one beautiful uh, feature that they can uh, divide and generate progeny that will be able to, to, to mature on one of these blood elements here. So that coupling of proliferation of cell division with maturation is uh, under very tight control. And any, any changes that can disturb that genetic changes will eventually result in, in, in some way uh, on the blood count. So it, either you will have less or more blood cells produced in different, uh, you know, uh, mature or immature stage. So, so the genetic changes that hit the bone marrow will have to be classified uh, in this respect. And you, you can already see here that there's some divergence here. So this is the myelin progenitin, and this is the lymphoid progenitin. So uh, the hematopoietic stem cell generates two basic types of cells, the lymphoid ones and the myeloid ones. And the myeloid ones are uh, uh, the cells that, that you will have in MPN affected. You can see the red blood cells, platelets, and so on. So if you then look into the classification of blood cancers, this you know, division between the lymphoid and myeloid has been preserved. But you can appreciate the number of all different uh, disease types that are just for the myeloid you know, malignancies are categorized. There are at least you know, 20 to 30 different types of, of blood cancers that are only you know, classified in the so-called myeloid arm of the, of, the, of the blood production. So I will not bother you more, but this is a basic thing to, to, to understand. And, and if you then looking at your, your disease, it is you know, classified uh, today by WHO as mild protein neoplasm, but there are two additional diseases there that are somewhat genetically related, but obviously have different severity. Acute myeloid leukemia, either happening you know, uh, uh, without any previous history of blood disease or secondary, either to myelodysplastic syndrome or MPN. So this is the disease group that we will focus our, 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 
uh, uh, on this, uh, uh, you know, the lecture is focused on this one. So again, coming back to the coupling of, of uh, stem cell division and maturation. So here is a, um, a simple picture showing that when the stem cell divides, it actually makes another stem cell and produces one progenitor that will start its maturation to either the red blood cell, or the, the platelet, or, or the other lineages. And again, every division requires a reproduction of the, uh, of the genetic code, which is the present in the stem cell. These are letters, the 3.3 billion letters of the stem cell has to be almost perfectly uh, uh, copied, and one goes to this stem cell and the other one to the progenitor. Obviously, that copying process is, is not 100% precise. So there are some mistakes happening, and these will accumulate. And we call these mistakes mutations. And you can see that every such division will leave some mistakes around. So eventually, you will then end up with a collection of mistakes or mutations that are just there as a consequence of cellular division. But some of these may prove to be advantages. So some of these mistakes you know, have no other, no, no phenotypic relevance, no biologic meaning, but some of them may. And one of those effects could be that this, the one particular stem cell starts to divide more frequently than the others, and all of a sudden establishes a dominant clone, and this would then eventually be able to you know, influence this process. So what can happen is that instead of many stem cells contributing to this blood production, you end up with a single stem cell driving the entire blood production. We call this monoclonal hematopoiesis, or a hematopoiesis of a single cell origin. And that actually will have different type of consequences if, if this uh, uh, abnormality was the BCR but translocation, you ended up with a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia because the overproduction hit only one element. If you look at the JAK2 mutation, that resulted in single cell origin of the hematopoiesis and resulted in overproduction of, of the red blood cells. Or, for example, keratic uh, thrombopathy receptor mutations may eventually do again single cell dominance at the stem cell level and predominantly overproduction of plates. So these genetic changes will variably hit the final outcome of blood production, and that would be diver di diversifying the phenotype uh, or the clinical presentation of individual patients into a rather plate, a rather red blood, uh, uh, red blood cell, or, or, or other. So the ultimate um, a genetic defect that can completely uh, uh, screw up the maturation is, is the, is the uh, 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 genetic changes that cause um, a leukemic transformation where the, the mutation will no longer allow the proper maturation of cells and the immature cells starts to accumulate in the bone marrow and the peripheral blood and this is, uh, you know, this diagnosis is compatible with leukemic transformation. So this is the, the, the worst type of, you know, mutation that can cause not only proliferation of the stem cell but at the same time abrogation of the maturation ability and that way, you know, the cells are arrested in an immature, highly proliferative state. Okay. So it has been already mentioned that genetics uh, uh, underwent a major revolution, and today, you know, reading the 3.3 billion letter code became relatively easy, even so it's not, uh, you know, cheap. But today we can do so all sorts of uh, genome sequencing uh, studies, and this is what my laboratory was uh, uh, involved in many times. We used initially uh, micro Macrays for this type of reading, which were limited to only 2 million letters after the 3.3 billions to be read. But today, the sequencing can basically read everything uh, uh, and determine the changes that the tumor has uh, as tumor features. So today, in MPN, we have three major mutation types. In, if, this is the breakdown in polycythemia, ET, and mild fibrosis. You can see that uh, the JAK2 mutations are predominantly polycythemia vera, and about half of ET and half of PMF patients have them. Uh, the characteristic mutations are restricted to ET and mild fibrosis, and essentially uh, its discovery filled in the diagnostic gap, the molecular diagnostic gap we had, and uh, at least frequent are the thrombopathy receptor mutations, and you see that they are variably about 5% present. But essentially, we have three so-called disease-driving mutations, or disease-associated mutations, JAK2, MPL, and KELAR. And also the gray zone here is still debate what, what, what does that mean? We call them triple negative patients, but again, the genetic studies are intensively targeting even these uh, 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 triple negative patients. But this is not the end of the story. Here is just the, uh, uh, you know, the genome is presented in a circle, and you can see the red 
all these different colors indicate all different types of genomic changes that we can identify in these patients. So you see that genetic complexity of, the, of this disease is quite diverse. So the question is how are we going to classify these diseases? And uh, before I do that, I would like to tell you that, uh, that the three disease mutations here, the JAK2, MPL, and KELAR, are not just, you know, uh, came out from, from the blue. They eventually target a very specific feature in the ste hematopoietic stem cells, and that, that feature uh, it has to do something with, with the regulation of growth and maturation. And uh, in the body, the hematopoietic system is controlled by hormones, we call them cytokines, that eventually instruct the bone marrow cells whether to divide uh, uh, or mature, mature and their, their uh, you know, uh, influence on the blood system you know, uh, uh, goes through interaction with receptors on the cellular surface. So you can see here uh, the thrombopoietin as the, as the cytokine, the receptor here on the, this is the surface of the cell, and the JAK2 kinase is basically taking, once this uh, hormone associates with its antenna, you know, this receptor here, then it will trigger signaling and it, uh, you know, through uh, uh, involvement of other types of proteins called stats, will bring in the signal to the nucleus where the genes are located, and this process will switch on genes that, you know, trigger proliferation. So this is the co main communication highway that is present. And the interesting thing to show you that if you look at just these three molecules, the thrombopoietin receptor, the JAK2, and here the kinetoculin, eventually all target this very small compartment uh, of the cell. Uh, I will have no time to show, but you know, eventually of a, of a data on kinetoculin indicate that it somehow uh, you know, mimics the role of, of, of thrombopoietin in just by associating to the thrombopoietin receptor in the absence of thrombopoietin triggers this signal. So all these three mutants have one thing in common, that will trigger the proliferative signal in the absence of thrombopoietin. So that is the main feature of MPN so far. Genetically, we can boil it down that the blood production works without hormonal instruction. So this is independent, cytokine independent, you know, proliferation is going. So this is a unifying feature of all the three types of MPN, the JAK2, keratinocytin, or thrombopoietin receptor mutated kind. So I don't have to tell you that uh, this is not where the story ends. Many of you are in the so-called chronic phase. Maybe some of you already progressed from chronic phase to the so-called accelerated phase. And, 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 and also this, this progression in a certain percentage of cases between 3 to 5% of the patients will eventually uh, have the chance to develop acute leukemia. So we would like to know what is going on genetically in these three stages to be able to classify. Here is just one sketch where we classify abnormalities on the chromosomes, and in the three species, you can see chronic, accelerated, and leukemic. And this, is, this bar, this red arrow, shows you uh, no genetic finding present. So you see that 45% of chronic face patients have nothing detectable, but that is dramatically changing during disease progression. This is, was an evidence that accumulation of genetic defect is strongly linked to the, to the, to the disease progression. And here is one sketch where you could you know, start mapping these abnormalities in the lifetime of the patient. So you imagine this line here is years, this would be time here, and the white uh, range here is a normal health, healthy hematopoiesis, and you can see that there are many types of abnormalities that can happen that are still compatible with, with health. And at some point, mutations like it, at this stage would be you know, acquisition of keratinocytin and MPL, and that would bring the the, the, the classification to the map of, uh, of uh, neoplasm, so at this time would be that this is duration of the patient. So maybe this is, you know, as some of you, 60 years or something like that. And you can see that this, this, this is duration can be variable, obviously, because of many reasons. And then the mutagenesis doesn't end there. So it means that mutations are further accumulated until, you know, and, and obviously therapy comes in play as well. So we do not understand yet how much of this acquisition of mutations uh, triggered by the therapy that is currently, you know, given to the patient, how much of it is natural evolution? Eventually, sometimes, you know, correction happens by the, in, you know, the therapeutic intervention, but then mutations can further accumulate that make therapy resistance, and that either brings the patient back to the chronic phase of MPN, or, you know, at this resistance type, you know, uh, there will be a potential risk for transformation. So these are, these are in a rough stage, you know, some sort of uh, putting the mutations in, in, in some sort of uh, time course during the disease. 
And here is some interesting data that, that uh, emerged just a couple of uh, uh, years back showing that if you look at mutations of the blood system and the so-called monoclonal origin of the blood, it also happens in the healthy individuals and it is age dependent. You can see here that about 10% you know, uh, of, of healthy individuals in the population between age 70 and 79 may already start accumulating the similar kind of mutations we see in NPN. So there is also some question to what degree we can classify the mutations here as disease driving. Maybe some of them accu accumulate already during the healthy stage. So I think that the mutation evolution started way before the actual MPN diagnosis has been made. And we do not know yet how far we have to go back, uh, you know, uh, um, before the diagnosis to start seeing some changes in the blood pressure. But this paper here suggested that perhaps there is a considerable, you know, time frame that this evolution already started. The question is whether we should and, and try to see and uh, uh, identify these patients in the population. That's a different question. So here, uh, by uh, you know, uh, trying to place these mutations that I, I mentioned, I would say that nobody you know, from my colleagues would doubt that the JAK2 MPL and keratinocolin are so-called the disease-causing mutations that are at the beginning of the disease, and these are the ones we would like to target by drugs. But again, the studies I mentioned before in the healthy individuals already you know, implicate the number of chromosomal aberrations, the number of mutations that maybe just what they do is initiate these single cell origin of hematopoietic, you know, because the clonal hematopoiesis, which doesn't really translate to changes in the blood count, but it already makes the shift from many stem cells producing blood in, you know, to the stage where only one stem cell produces the blood. And this is a major, 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 uh, you know, uh, 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 phenomenon of major importance. So here I also put down some so-called germline influences. I'm not sure how many of you have a family history of MPN, so we already studied these influences because these are genetic influences that are not acquired. They are not tumor featured. They are acquired and inherited, not acquired, but inherited. So it means that you may have uh, in, in your families some sort of predispositions that may be worthwhile to study. And in this respect, we, we also studied with these genetic technologies I was, uh, as was mentioning, with exome sequencing, some pedigrees where we could see you know, ET, PV, malofibrosis patients, and you could identify some mutations in the gene called RBPP6. But this is just one example of, of those, you know, influences that can come from, 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 from germline. So here we could uh, place also uh, uh, non-acquired but hereditary factors making these other mutations, you know, easier to acquire or be acquired at, at higher likelihood. So these are the ones in a year I would like to then also mentioned the mutations that this is ongoing work, not only from my laboratory, but other laboratories, that we try to identify mutations that would predict or be somehow very close to the transformation process. So if, if this mutation would emerge during the chronic phase, it would give us, you know, through genetic analysis, some indication that perhaps there's a certain risk that the patient might transform into a, a, a worse disease. And these are very important because we would like to really be able to pick them up in the so-called chronic phase. For example, the P53 mutation, CBL, or IDH, all, all these mutations here may be present in about 1% or maybe less than 1% in the chronic phase. And these are the patients that perhaps are already marked for the, uh, or already set on the course for transforming to leukemia. We would like to capture this stage and these patients very early enough because then the clinicians will have a much bigger therapeutic window to intervene. So these are, we call these genetic you know, markers to, to be you know, prognostically relevant. It gives us a little hint what may happen in the future with a certain likelihood. So this is what is still ongoing, you know, uh, this identifying these prognostic markers that would you know, somehow facilitate uh, us or the clinicians to, to make decisions on, on, on how much of this is a risk. So here I would like to switch gears because, you know, if you just look at, look at all of you, uh, in this room. Everybody is different. In average, if you just randomly pick, you know, two uh, uh, members of the audience, we may actually, by genetic terms, in the 3.3 billion letters of genetic code, in average, we differ in about a million of those positions. So it means that, yes, you are ET with Jack positive, you know, diagnosis, but <clears throat> none of the, you know, no patients look alike genetically. So it means that there may be some clinical consequences of this uh, basic genetic difference between one patient and the other. And, and you know, if you, if you try to see each individual, you know, uh, 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 patient 
there are at least a thousand so-called private variants that are not even included in the databases of normal genetic variability. So each of us, from my family back, we carry at least a thousand variants that no one else has in the population just by my pedigree. So it means that these are mutations that are very rare in the population but may have significant influence on, on this discourse. And here, I would just give you a flavor of one of the studies we have done. We, we, we tried to look at the genetic variability in patients that developed arterial thrombosis during the chronic phase of MPN. And we found a genetic variant that, that was you know, a, a present predominant of those patients that had myocardial infarction or stroke, and you could see that if you just uh, divide the patients by this genetic variant, a variant A or B, you could see that the prognosis is the, uh, you know, uh, can be uh, uh, significantly uh, altered. So these are genetic variants that will be probably the next step. What is the last thing missing in the genetics of NPN would be understanding how inter-individual variability, genetic variability, may have influence on the disease cause because, again, gives clinicians tools to set the expectations right to somehow calculate the probability of complications uh, based on genetic markers in future. So uh, here I would like to um, end and thank uh, a whole lot of people that, uh, you know, uh, participated in all different kinds of collaborations. Uh, you know, this is, this is my, my former or past la uh, lab members, but essentially, you know, the 11 groups at, at my institute, all of them are already influenced by, you know, uh, all these MPN-related questions. So many of our collaborators come from my institute, but obviously the clinical collaborations with Heinz Gislinger from the Medical University of Vienna, Maria Katsula from Pavia, together these centers can put together almost 2,000 patients. So we have a lot of genetic information that you could then use statistical uh, comparisons to you know, try to find these genetic predictors, how disease will develop in future. So here I would like to uh, thank you, and uh, I hope I will be able to answer your questions.